Hey guys, so in this video we're going to be looking at the psychological influences on adolescent development and specifically the thing that's going to drive most of this video is an adolescent's moral development. How do they decide what's right and what's wrong and how does that development process take place? And the key theorist that we're going to look at is Lawrence Kohlberg. So you're going to want to title your notes Kohlberg's Theories of Moral Development. And before we get started, it's going to be important to define what are ethics and what are morals because there's a slight difference. So ethics are like the standards for society, that standards that guide moral behavior. Your moral behavior is like what you actually do yourself. So the best way that I know to explain the difference between ethics and morals is with this statement. An ethical man knows he shouldn't cheat on his wife, but a moral man doesn't cheat on his wife. So the ethics kind of set the standard, but what you choose to do is your morals. So Kohlberg has three stages of moral development that we each go through, and they are pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. And in this video we're going to go through each one of them. So the first one is called pre-conventional, and this is um, up until a child is about age nine. And the whole pre-conventional stage is very egocentric, meaning that it's all about the kid. And there are two characteristics that classify the stage. The first one is punishment and obedience. And so basically what this means is that it is a moral thing if they do not get punished for it. If they get punished for it, then it's immoral. So um, not only do little kids think like this, but we can too. So for example, if you're in AP Psych class and we're taking a test and you could cheat but you decide not to cheat on the test because you know that I'm watching at all times and I catch you and you get a detention and get in trouble. So if you don't cheat to avoid punishment, then that would be pre-conventional moral thinking. The second characteristic is individualism and exchange. So this is all based on reciprocity. So let's say that you're taking that same AP Psychology test and you sit next to Brenda and Brenda cheats off of you all the time and so one day you're not prepared for the test and so you decide well Brenda cheats off me all the time so I'm gonna cheat off her so it's okay so because you you justify cheating based upon that reciprocity if she's cheated on me then I can cheat on her test no big deal it's moral the second stage is called the conventional stage and this is usually developed by early adolescence and this is no longer characterized by egocentrism, what's all about you, but it's actually characterized um, by your attitude towards others. So the first characteristic is called good boy, nice girl, but basically what this means is that your morals are driven by what other people think about you. So let's say you're in the AP Psych test and you're considering whether or not you want to cheat, and you respect me as a teacher, and so you decide not to cheat because you couldn't live with the shame of knowing that I think you're a cheater um, if you were to get caught cheating. The second characteristic of this stage is called law and order, meaning that you have morals based on whatever the law is. So the school has a policy against plagiarism. You are not allowed to cheat according to the handbook, and so if you value that law just because it's a law, then you're not going to cheat on that test. Another example is like if you go back to the time of slavery, um, there are a lot of people in the north that were against slavery, but they wouldn't help runaway slaves because it was against the law. Even though maybe their morals transcended the law, they were so stuck on, does this break the law, does this not break the law, and so they wouldn't help them if it did. The third stage is called the post-conventional stage, and this is the final stage of development. And Kohlberg said that not everybody reaches this stage because there's a lot of transcendent abstract thinking that occurs. So the first characteristic of this stage is called the social contract. And what this means is that you develop morality based on an, um, an agreed upon set of rights between people. Um, the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And because you're focusing on, on the group, sometimes individuals can be hurt or left out if more people are benefited than are hurt. So um, for example, if we're using the an AP test example, let's say you're taking this development test and you just think that I did a terrible job teaching this unit and you there's a socially agreed upon standard that all students deserve quality teachers that know how to teach the unit before they take the test and you just feel like you were done a disservice and that that standard was not met um, so you justify cheating on the test because you're like this isn't even fair that I'm taking the test we all deserve a quality teacher and we didn't get it so we're gonna justify cheating that's the social contract. The centristic is called the universal ethical principles and what this means is that 
you as an individual can decide um, what are your universal principles that apply to all human beings and you're willing to break laws if you need to in order to um, establish and to defend your rights so for example let's say that your best friend is in AP psych and she will get beat at home if she fails this test and you know she didn't study and so you offer to let her cheat off of your test because it's more important to you that she doesn't get beat at home than if you get caught cheating during class you're willing to take that consequence because it's more important for you to keep her safe okay so a really quick recap preconventional stage is usually before age nine even though after age nine we still use it um, but this is driven by egocentrism and what's in it for you to avoid punishment or gain rewards the second stage conventional stage this is um, all about obeying the law and what's the social order and how you gain social approval or you stay away from negative social disapproval and then the third stage, which not everybody gets to, is called post-conventional, and this is morality based on your own principles. You're willing to go against what society says is right or wrong because of what you say is right or wrong. So how did Kohlberg come up with these three stages of development? He did so because of this scenario he came up with called the Heinz Dilemma. And the Heinz Dilemma is, is really famous, you might have even heard of it before. But after asking a lot of people what they would do in this situation, he ended up coming up with these three stages. So what I want you to do now is I want you to read the Heinz Dilemma. So I want you to pause the video, read it, and then go through the six stages, um, the six characteristics of the three stages that we just talked about, and see if you can come up with a response to this dilemma that fits each of the six characteristics to see if you understand what we just did in the video. So here are some potential answers for the Heinz Dilemma, so I want you to check this against what you wrote. And this is not exhaustive, um, but this is just some of the things that um, I came up with. So hopefully you get it and we're all good here, but if you don't, just bring your questions to class tomorrow. So there are some major criticisms of Kohlberg's theory, and most of his criticisms came from a woman named Carol Gilligan. And the first thing that she highlighted in his Heinz situation is that when Kohlberg tested people, he only tested boys. And there's some serious general differences between how boys rationalize and girls rationalize morality. For example, on average, men tend to be more black and white with what's wrong, what's right, what's just, what's unjust and then girls tend to be more situational they have more gray areas they see it for each individual situation rather than a blanket statement for all and so his theory automatically assumes that women thinking is inferior to men based on how he structured his stages another big criticism of Kohlberg is that it favored Western individualized thinking because his post conventional stage was all about you know what you say goes it transcends society's morals and standards and so if you're in an Asian culture that values the group over the individual well then you're not gonna have anybody that reaches that post conventional that highest level of stage also it can be seen as dangerous if you have someone that is in that post conventional stage because you know if we as a society value life and you have somebody in that post conventional stage that thinks it's okay to murder then you know, that's, that's a dangerous person for society, even though they're in that highest level of moral development. So just because they're in the third stage doesn't necessarily mean that their morality is good. And then the last criticism was that um, sometimes there's a disconnect between one's moral reasoning and what they actually do, their behavior. People are really inconsistent with their reasoning. It kind of just depends on the day, depends on the situation. And so it was hard to, to classify if someone is in one stage or not. It's based upon the situation. So those are some criticisms of Kohlberg, but um, he was still very influential to psychological thought involving the cognitive um, and psychological development of adolescence. So how, as a psychologist, do we actually teach morality or encourage people to be moral? Here are three things that psychologists say will help teach morality. Um, if you actually force them to be in empathetic situations, putting them in someone else's shoes, so, you know, making them sleep in a cardboard box at night to, to simulate what a homeless person would feel like, giving them activities to delay gratification and work on discipline, and then modeling moral behavior. So a lot of schools are moving towards service learning requirements for graduation uh, because they want their students to leave school with this idea of morality, whatever that means for them. 
Real quick here, just some other cognitive development things that happen during adolescence other than someone's moral development. Um, they do enter into that formal operational thought stage from Piaget, if you remember him, that's his final stage. And they do have the ability to reason, but there are two things that kind of keep them from reasoning well. And those two things, um, one is called the imaginary audience, and this is the phenomenon that um, adolescents always think that more people are watching them and talking about them than really are, but you're constantly kind of paranoid about that. And then the second one is called personal fable, where um, you feel like you're the only one that's experiencing it, and nobody else knows what's going on in your life, nobody else can understand, when in reality, there's lots of people that are going through the same thing you are, but you don't see it that way. You see yourself on an island, and nobody else can reach you. So... All of those things are the, the social, or the, excuse me, the psychological influences on adolescent development. So I believe now you have a practice worksheet or practice packet that I'd like you to do. So go ahead and get started on that, and then we will go over the answers in class tomorrow. Please have it done, because we're going to move on to social development tomorrow. Thanks.